So at this point, you could look throughout the courtroom and you could see that not a chair was empty. And everybody right now was looking up to the judge. All he had to do was grab his hammer, his gavel, smack it down and say guilty. And everybody would have got up and started applauding and justice would have been served. But instead, this happened. Thirty-six-year-old Brenda Sue Schaefer was generally a happy person, and over the last few weeks, her friends and even some of her family and co-workers started to detect these problems between the two. And when I say between the two, it's because Brenda had been dating 50-year-old Mel Ignatow for two years. And recently, people started to know these things about Mel that were going on, and they just thought that he wasn't a good mix for Brenda. And Brenda, at this point, had had enough of Mel and decided to end the relationship. But Mel was very just possessive. He was very controlling. And he was also physically and emotionally abusive. And he was also sexually abusive. And pressuring Brenda to marry him, Brenda told her friends, all Mel thinks about is sex and himself. It's like he wants to own me. He literally wants my body and soul. So finally, in September 1988, Brenda told Mel that she was moving on with her life and arranged to meet with him to give back the jewelry that he once bought her. And on September 24th, she drove up to his house in Louisville, Kentucky, just to do that. But suddenly, suddenly, right after this, Brenda went missing. Now, Mel Ignatow, of course, was the initial suspect when Brenda's car was found the next day and it was totally abandoned. The vehicle had been left on the street less than a half of a mile away from the house that she shared with her parents. And now, having found this vehicle, Brenda's father phoned Ignatow and asked him about Brenda's whereabouts. Ignatow, you know, seemed very surprised by this question. He admitted that Brenda had visited his house the previous evening, but then she left around 11, and that he hadn't seen her since. But Brenda's father had a gut feeling going on, and he didn't believe him. And as soon as he hung up the phone with Ignatel, he dialed the Jefferson County Police and told them that his daughter was missing and that he suspected Mel Ignatel was involved. So this case was then assigned to Detective Jim Wellesley of the Violet Crimes Unit, who brought Ignatow in for questioning that very same day. And during that interrogation, Ignatow repeated essentially the story that he'd given Brenda's father, that Brenda had left his house at about 11 p.m. and that he hadn't seen her since. But Ignatow's demeanor was a dead giveaway to an experienced investigator like Wesley. I mean, he was cocky, over-friendly, almost challenging the detective to prove that he was lying. And Wesley, of course, couldn't do that, not without evidence. And sorry to say, at this point, there was no evidence. But if Ignatel was indeed involved in Brenda's disappearance, he'd done a very good job covering his tracks. So at this point, months had passed by with no clue as to what had become of Brenda Schaefer. The police by now were certain that she had been killed and remained convinced that Ignatel was involved. But they had nothing on him, and Ignatel knew that. He appeared to be relishing in his notoriety, never shying away from cameras or failing to give some smug soundbite to reporters. So eventually, with no leads to work, the FBI of Louisville police called in renowned FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood. And what they basically did is they asked his assessment on their main suspect. They wanted to know what his profile was. And Hazelwood's report had confirmed what they had felt all along. Ignatow was not only a narcissist obsessed with his own self-image and with other material possessions, 
but he was also very self-centered. I mean, he drove a Corvette, he owned a 32-foot pleasure boat, and lived in, in affluent parts of town. He also was known as a pathological liar, and Hazelwood believed that he showed characteristics of a sexual sadist, someone who gets off on the suffering of others. Hazelwood also noted that it appeared that Ignatow throughout his life would regard women not as people but as possessions. So what does that mean? That means he would have not accepted Brenda's intention to break up with him and may have well decided to punish her for it. And having decided at this point to kill her, he may have wanted to make this murder an enjoyable experience for himself. Brenda may well have been subjected to sexual torture before she was killed. More on that later. This profile though made for a fascinating reading, but it did not amount to much evidence. There was however one clue in the document on how the police might be able to proceed. You see, U.S. Attorney Scott Cox thought that Ignatow's narcissistic need for publicity might be able to be used against him. So he asked Ignatow if he would be prepared to testify before a federal grand jury to clear his name once and for all. And Ignatow, of course, you know, jumped at this opportunity. There was no way that he was going to miss out on the moment in the spotlight. And the police, their main hopes throughout this was that Ignatow would slip up and tell the grand jury testimony in something that he didn't want to release from his lips. And he actually did make one major mistake. He mentioned the name of his former girlfriend, Mary Ann Shore. So at that point, then Shore was hauled in to testify. And she was not quite as sharp as Ignatow. And asked whether she had ever met Brenda Schaefer, Shore said that she had, but, but, but only once. And then she was asked to describe what Brenda looked like. And she said, you mean the last time I saw her? Whoops. Right then, realizing her mistake, she got up and then fled out of the courtroom. The police now had a weak point to probe at, and they brought Marianne Shore in for questioning and then leaned on her and leaned on her some more. And before long, she had cracked, admitting that she had been present while Ignatow was torturing Brenda. The murder, she said, happened at the Louisville home that she had been renting, and Ignatel had made elaborate preparations, carrying out scream tests to try and determine whether the neighbors could be able to hear any cries for help, and also digging a deep hole in the woods behind his property to serve as a makeshift grave once things were done. And it was at that moment that Brenda was lured into Shore's home after returning the jewelry to Ignatow. She was then overpowered at gunpoint, tied up and subjected to hours of sexual torture, during which she was sexually assaulted, sodomized, and beaten. Shore admitted that she was present during this ordeal and even confessed to taking pictures of Brenda being assaulted However, she was adamant that she had not witnessed the murder. According to her, Ignatow had brought a bottle of chloroform with him and had later told her that he had held a chloroform-soaked rag over Brenda's mouth. And then once it was over Brenda's mouth and her nose, he just kept holding it there, not only in allowing her to pass out, but then killing her. And it was at that point, unfortunately, that Brenda stopped breathing and died. Shore insisted that she did not participate in the actual killing part. Nonetheless, she was an accessory at best and might even find herself charged as a murder co-accused. She could even be looking at life in prison or possibly even the death penalty. So faced with these potential outcomes, Shore begged prosecutors for a deal. And of course they agreed, offering to drop all charges except that of tampering with evidence in exchange she would testify against Ignatow at trial and would also wear a wire in this attempt to get an admission of murder out of him. So on January 10th, 1989, Mary Ann Shore led the police to Brenda Schaefer's body that was buried in the woods behind Shore's house. Brenda was then lifted from the ground 
16 months after she had officially disappeared. Shortly thereafter, Mel Ignatow was finally arrested and charged with her murder. And it would be two years before he was brought to trial in Covington, Kentucky. But the case against Ignatow was far from solid. You see, the advanced decomposition of the body at that point made it impossible to retrieve any physical evidence. And the prosecution could not even say with certainty how she had died. The case, therefore, rested heavily on Mary Ann Shore. And unfortunately, she turned out to be a terrible witness. Weighing in at over 200 pounds, Marianne arrived into court looking totally unprofessional. She was wearing this mini skirt, and when I say mini skirt, I mean a mini, mini skirt, which was hiked high up her thighs as she sat down into the witness box. Bad start. And she appeared to regard these proceedings as a source of amusement, joking and giggling her way through her testimony. Then, under cross-examination, she was visibly flustered when the defense attorney suggested that it was her who had killed Brenda Schaefer. And that she had done this for a plausible reason. Because she came into this jealous rage over Ignatow's affections of Brenda. All in all, Shore was definitely a hindrance to the prosecution case rather than a help. But prosecutors had one more trump card, a tape recording of a conversation between Marianne Shore and Mel Ignatow. Now this was played to the jurors, and although Ignatow never mentioned outright the act of murder, he did make certain incriminating statements. Unfortunately, one crucial word was obscured by static. The prosecutor insisted that Ignatow had said the word sight sight as in referencing to the place where Brenda was buried. But the jury heard it differently. They were sure that he said safe and interpret this as a reference to a buried strong box, perhaps containing valuables. Sight, safe. I mean, I guess on a recording, it could sound similar. But this discrepancy was enough for them to find Mill Ignatow not guilty. Ignatow's acquittal meant that only one person would be going to jail for the murder case of Brenda Schaefer. And that would be Mary Ann Shore, because she pled guilty to a charge of evidence tampering and served three years behind bars. Ignatow, meanwhile, was a free man, and the legal principle of double jeopardy meant that he could never, ever be tried for the murder of Brenda Schaefer again. If any of you have seen the movie Double Jeopardy with, I believe, Ashley Judd in the early 2000s, this is a striking similar case. In some ways. Now everyone, and I mean everyone, knew that Mel had done it. But Ignatow didn't care. In the eyes of the law, he was now an innocent man. But sometimes, just sometimes, the grace of God through the Holy Spirit will come down himself and make you face karma because fate, however, was about to deal Ignatow the hand that he deserved. So at this point, we are six months after the murder trial, and the new owners of Ignatow's former home were doing some remodeling. And while ripping up some carpet, a workman came across a Ziploc bag containing several items of jewelry. So the man decided to report this find to the police. He did the right thing. And the items turned out to be those Brenda had returned to Ignatow on the night that she went missing. But wait, there's more. This fortuitous find brought the police back into the house to carry out another search. And they had already gone through the property twice and found nothing. This time, however, they had hit the mother load. Hidden in one of those heating ducts was a stack of quite horrific photographs. And they showed Brenda Sue Schaefer being sexually assaulted and tortured. And the assailant's face was not shown in any of the pictures, but Ignatel was easily identified by his distinctive moles on his body. Man, just imagine what the prosecution could have done with this evidence just six months earlier. But now, of course, it was all too late. Even with such conclusive evidence of wrongdoing, Ignatel could not be retried, at least not for murder. He could, however, be prosecuted for perjuring himself in his grand jury testimony. 
faced with the prospect of jail time related to those charges, Ignatel tried to strike a deal with prosecutors. And after years and years of denying involvement in Brenda's death, he now openly admitted that he had sexually tortured her and killed her. He even had the gall to tell her family that she had not suffered and that she had died peacefully. So convicted of perjury, Ignatow would now spend five years in prison. But the law wasn't done with him yet because there was now another perjury charge to answer for. And shortly after Brenda's disappearance, Ignatow had become involved in an altercation with her employer who had threatened to kill him unless he revealed her whereabouts. Ignatow had filed charges and the matter had ended up in court. And during the course of that trial, Ignatow had once again lied under oath. And now he would pay the price. A second perjury conviction landed him back in prison for another nine years. Ignatel was released from his second prison term in December 2006. He emerged a broke and broken man who was often heard by his upstairs neighbor shouting for God to just put him out of his misery. And God once again listened again because that wish was granted on September 1st, 2008 when he was found dead at his home. It appeared that Ignatel had stumbled and fallen, crashing through a glass coffee table and suffering lacerations to his arms and skin. He then stumbled towards the kitchen, probably in an attempt to grab the phone to call 911. However, he never made it, collapsing through blood loss and bleeding out on the kitchen floor. I mean, he surely died a painful death. Now, if you want to find out how Brenda was lured to the property and what Brenda actually had to go through step by step, I recorded that as well, but I thought it would be way too graphic to put on YouTube. So when I start my Patreon or my YouTube Jordan button, it will be the first story to go on there. Believe me, some of you probably do not want to hear the treacherous endeavors that Brenda had to go through. But then again, some of you probably do want to hear about it. And let me know in the comments right now where your position is. But I hope you enjoyed this story and make sure to hit the like button if you haven't already. And that's all I have for you today. I'll see you next time. Cheers.